Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, even though it's remote uh, due to my schedule. I wish I were there in Krishna. I want to underline that the world has changed dramatically since the breakup of former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. That was, we know now, the unipolar moment, when the U.S. had no rivals and together with Europe could do what it wanted in the Balkans and much of the rest of the world. With a lot of help from Croatia, NATO ended the Bosnian War at Dayton in 95, forced Serbia's withdrawal from Kosovo in 1999. Europe and the U.S. together, and that's important, invested massive financial and personnel resources in Kosovo as a UN protectorate mandated to build self-governing democratic institutions. But that unipolar moment ended with the attack on the World Trade Center in 2001 and the U.S. responses in Afghanistan and Iraq. The state building process in Kosovo had significant momentum, however, and it continued. First with standards before status and later standards with status, leading eventually to supervised and unsupervised independence. Kosovo has not had an easy time of it, but I think the young state has risen to at least some of the challenges quite well. The economy has grown after an initial spurt Kosovo managed to limit Islamist radicalization. The courts have begun to prosecute high-level corruption cases. And Kosovo has managed several power transitions in accordance with election outcomes. I'd like to undo it right now. Kosovo has had ultimate in power. In ways that a number of other countries in the Balkans have not managed to achieve. But there is one that is directly different from the one that existed in 2001 or the independence in 2008. While still globally dominant, the U.S. faces regional challenges from China, Russia, Iran, and even North Korea to take priority in Washington over anything in the Balkans. Bosnia and Kosovo, the, the object of top-tier attention in the 1990s, now get much lower priority. That's true in Europe as well, where Brexit, Ukraine, and illegal migration are issues that each in its own way cast a shadow over, the Balkan, aspira over Balkan aspirations to join Europe. At the same time, Moscow and Beijing are paying more attention than ever before to the Balkans. The Russians are interfering blatantly with both violent and nonviolent means, assassination, media manipulation, renting crowds and financing political parties. They're doing all these things to slow, if not halt, Balkan progress towards NATO in particular, but also, I think, now towards the EU. The Chinese are using their financial strengths to build and buy. The buyer beware, of course. My own view is that Beijing's behavior is a lot more salubrious than Moscow's and likely to produce some positive results for those Balkan countries and companies that know how to do business and don't fall for bad deals. Turkey also a strong force in the Balkans for historical, geographic, and cultural reasons, has taken a dramatic turn in the more Islamist and autocratic direction. The secular Turkey that contributed forces to NATO interventions in the 1990s and was very successful doing it is now moribund. Erdogan's Turkey is building mosques, capturing Gulenists, and encouraging political Islam while trying to maintain its previous good relations with non-Muslim countries in the Balkans. So how does all of this affect Kosovo? 
the Turkish influence is direct and palpable. Though still largely secular in orientation, Kosovo is far more Islamic than it once was and has cooperated with the capture and rendering Gulenis in ways that don't seem right to me. As for the Chinese, most Kosovars might welcome more interest in investment from Beijing. I wouldn't fault Kosovo for that, but only urge caution caution about the financial and political conditions, which can be onerous. The Chinese don't insist on things like human rights, of course, but they do insist that countries uh, that benefit from their financing uh, toe the line about Taiwan and other issues that they're concerned about. The Russians have no purchase on the Kosovo Albanians, of which I know, but their weight with the Kosovo and Serbian Serbs is certainly felt inside Kosovo. Moscow is a strong advocate of land swaps because, of course, they would justify things like the annexation of Crimea. And, of course, Moscow blocks Kosovo entry into the UN and opposes its entry into other international organizations. I really don't know how Moscow will be brought around eventually to accepting Kosovo's UN mem membership. That's still a mystery to me. Even, and it's, uh, it's, I don't know anybody who knows the solution to that. It's going to require an agreement between the Russians and the Americans. Washington continues to have enormous influence in Kosovo. I think we know that. But it's not the same Washington as even three years ago. Today's Washington has an ethnic nationalist, not a liberal democratic administration. Trump and some of his closest advisors are self-avowed nationalists who do not believe in equal rights. That, in my view, is why they were open to the failed land swap idea which may have died in Kosovo, but I'm afraid still survives underneath the radar in Washington. As for Europe, its failure of nerve is all too evident to everyone in the Balkans. The French and Dutch vetoes are on opening the accession negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia, negotiations that might take a decade. That veto was tragic. So, too, is failure to provide the visa waiver to Kosovo. So, the Western liberal democratic influence in the Balkans has unquestionably declined. The Eastern autocratic and ethno-nationalist influence, if I can use that umbrella term to refer to the very different roles of Russia, China, and Turkey, has grown. So my bottom line is that responsibility for keeping the Western aspiration alive now rests more than in the past with people in the Balkans, the government, citizens, and society of Kosovo all have an important role to play, a role that they didn't necessarily play in the past. The Europeans have already disappointed Kosovo. The Americans, I'm afraid, may do likewise. The Chinese and Turks will try to lure Kosovo in bad direction, while the Russians will give aid and comfort to Kosovo's antagonists. But I think Kosovo showed how unified and profoundly good they can be uh, to the English soccer fans. We were all impressed with that. I hope they will harness that spirit to the cause of maintaining a liberal democracy that treats all its citizens equally. It's a very simple sentence to maintain a liberal democracy that treats all its citizens equally, but it's a very profoundly important and complicated task. But I hope to see it accomplished. I hope to see it, uh, the, the hope of that maintained through 
uh, however long this American administration lasts and through however long the uh, recession in Europe and the Euro skepticism that it is associated with it lasts. I want to uh, end there. Um, thank you very much. That was uh, very illuminating. Um, what I'll try and do is, if you relay questions to me, I'll try and answer them through this. Can you hear me on this? I, I do hear you. Okay. okay. It's not Kosovo specific, um, but it's more based around China's growing influence around the world. Um, you see from Africa to Europe, China is investing heavily in infrastructure. When we were in Dubrovnik in summer, um, there was talk of a bridge that the Chinese might be building um, to link two parts of, I think it was either Bosnia or Croatia together. Um, I, I wondered, is there any antidote to the rise of China in that sense, in terms of influencing um, other states, or is it simply relentless and unstoppable? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last bit in the question. Is the rise of, uh, rise of China's economic hegemony across the world uh, stoppable or unstoppable? I would say unstoppable uh, in the longer term and highly desirable that it continue. Uh, I think uh, people who worry about China in the United States, serious people who worry about China, worry as much about Chinese failure as they do about Chinese success. The reason for that is that the world economy today depends heavily on Chinese growth. And Chinese growth has been going at almost 7% per year for a long time. China today is a capitalist economy. And the one thing we can be sure of in capitalist economies is business cycles. And when China suffers its first recession, uh, the whole world is going to know about it. The building of infrastructure, I, I've always had a hard time understanding the fear of Chinese infrastructure because, of course, Chinese infrastructure is not only the, the infrastructure they finance, as opposed to the infrastructure they own, is not only available for use to the Chinese, but to everybody else on Earth as well. Uh, I think, I think uh, the alarm about China is overblown, including the alarm about Chinese ambitions. I mean, uh, Yes, China wants to be a rival of the United States, but the Chinese I talk to see that as a very long-term goal. Uh, I see it as a long-term goal. Uh, they, they, and they are quite frightened of the responsibilities that comes with becoming a global power. Uh, and they do recognize that those responsibilities exist and are unavoidable. So... Yes, China is important in the world today and growing in importance. But fear is not the only response we should be feeling. Can I just challenge you there? Should we, we may not fear their economic growth, but surely we should fear at least uh, their human rights track record. Um, some might argue there's a genocide going on uh, in regard to the Uyghurs, there's been substantial repression in Tibet, um, Falun Gong, and others. This is antithetical to our entire values, the whole premise on which our democracies and the global world order, as we understand it, have been founded. And, and I would have thought there was scope for fear there. Yes, I think, I think that's a reasonable, I wouldn't say fear, but a very reasonable concern I think we should be talking to the Chinese about it. I think they're making dramatic mistakes internally. And this is a question of, the, of Chinese behavior inside China more than Chinese behavior outside China. And uh, 
it, it seems to me that what they've set themselves up for is uh, is a um, is political dissent that won't be satisfied uh, with uh, more rights, but which will seek um, separation. I mean, if you're a Hong Kong uh, citizen today, I mean, what would make you want to be part of China? If you're a Taiwanese citizen today, what would make you want to be part of China? And certainly if you're in Xinjiang, what would make you want to be part of China? The Chinese are, are, are making it very difficult to t hold China together. Um, you mentioned that, uh, you mentioned Russia's influence on Kosovo Serbs, uh, but not Kosovo Albanians. How so, and in, in what context are they influencing the Serbs of Kosovo? Eternally. Uh, I'm sorry, again, I missed a little bit of the end of the question. Uh, how are they influencing the Kosovo Serbs, uh, and in what context? Are they, what, the Kosovo, helping the Kosovo Serbs? Uh, so are uh, all the Chinese uh, influencing... Oh, no, Russia, I'm sorry, he mentioned that Russia has uh, influence, has failed to have influence on the Kosovo Albanians, but not Kosovo Serbs. And, uh, but co but uh, towards Kosovo Serbs. How so? And in what context? Because this was mentioned in the beginning of the of the discussion. Yes, uh, the Russian influence on the Kosovo Serbs. Uh, my view is that the main Russian influence on the Kosovo Serbs comes through Belgrade. I mean, Belgrade uh, is uh, has its own reasons uh, for trying to keep the Kosovo Serbs in particular in the north, separate from Kosovo. But Moscow is very supportive of that effort. Uh, it's quite different from the situation in Bosnia, where Mo Moscow supports uh, Republika Srpska quite independently of its policy towards Belgrade. Uh, and I think, in fact, uh, I know that people in Belgrade uh, ha have been concerned that they don't have as much influence over Dodik as they would like, partly because the because the Russians support him separately. I think they do much of that, less of that with the Kosovo Serbs uh, in the north. I think their influence is felt mainly through um, Belgrade's behavior. Uh, I don't know of any particular influence from uh, Moscow on the Kosovo Serb south of the Ibar River, uh, where the attitudes towards uh, uh, towards Belgrade, towards Pisha, are really quite dramatically different from uh, the attitudes in the north. Adam, thank you very much. Um, have a very good rest of your morning. And... Um Oh, I'm sorry, there's one more. Apologies, one more. Thank you for your lectures, Mr. Daniel Server. I want to ask something about that um, you did mention in today. You said that the uh, European Union would decide to uh, start negotiations for Northern Macedonia and for Albania, but also the European Union did not give permission to visit the Kosovo without the regime of visa. But now there is a, something which uh, our leader, local leaders here in Europe are raising something which is now called from politicians is as a mirror sword. And, and so the political parties of Kosovo and some of the leaders of Kosovo are not participating in this mirror sword. And some of the leaders are saying that this mirror sword leads us to ex Yugoslavia as it was, but now we are preparing to become a leader to become another ex Yugoslavia. What is your opinion on this? Thank you. There, there's a long history of people trying to convince the countries of the Balkans in one configuration or another to settle for some sort of free trade area outside the European Union rather than being part of the European Union. In the past, it was sometimes put forward as a step towards accession to the EU. Uh, 
my view is that uh, the countries of the Balkans will be much more comfortable, I think, with what's called the regatta, uh, rather than with this, uh, these proposals for alternatives. Of course, there can be no so-called mini Schengen as long as uh, Kosovo and Serbia haven't settled the issue of the tariffs, but let's let's assume that that issue uh, gets settled sometime soon. Uh, I think there'll still be doubts about any kind of uh, mini Schengen area, which is broader than free trade, admittedly, because it presumably means free movement of people as well. Uh, it's a road that to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, if Kosovo and Serbia could agree to free movement of people, uh, the all issues between them would be already solved. Uh, and if they could agree to free trade uh, between them, uh, all the issues would be solved. So, uh, I'm afraid that these proposals for uh, agglomerations of Balkan countries outside the EU uh, interfere with the process of uh, EU accession, and I'm afraid they're a poor excuse uh, for it. Uh, if I were uh, a Balkan citizen, I would want to imitate Montenegro, uh, and Montenegro has been clear and unequivocal. It's going for EU membership as fast as it can. I think it's not going to be daunted by what the by what the French uh, and the uh, Dutch did. Uh, they are simply going to get ready, implement the acquis, implement uh, other requirements of the EU, and then uh, press for uh, full accession. They did that with NATO. Uh, you know, Djukanovic came to Washington a few years before accession to NATO, and and everybody here in Washington told him how difficult that was going to be, and uh, he was undaunted and uh, went ahead, prepared for it. Uh, was uh, very, uh, what should I say, purposeful about it. And to me, that's that makes sense because you get most of the benefits of EU accession from preparing for the EU. Uh, Kosovo has been passing legislation that's EU compliant uh, since independence, but it doesn't implement a lot of that legislation. It needs to get much more serious about implementing it. And I would be, I would be skeptical. I wouldn't say I'd oppose it in any sense, but if Kosovo decided to join any Schengen or any other grouping uh, that is not uh, full EU accession, I would ask, you know, what are you getting out of that? Uh, and wouldn't it be better to concentrate your efforts on full qualification for the EU? Thank you very much. That's um, all the time we've got for it today. Yeah. But, uh, really appreciate your joining us today and um, goodbye. You're welcome. I'm sorry I can't be there with you. Next time. Thank you.